Hi everyone, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. This is Brooke Aikens, and on behalf of Q1 Productions and IBA Industrial, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar will have a case study focus on what X-ray brings to you, uh, X-ray versus other modalities and comparison case study. We're very lucky to have two speakers with us today, uh, Mr. Frederick Desi, who's the product manager at IBA Industrial, as well as Frederick Stickelbalt, who's the R&D uh, nu Nuclear Interactions Domain Expert, as well as an IBA Fellow at IBA. And again, they'll be presenting on a comparison case study on x-rays and other modalities. Uh, please note that a copy of today's presentation recording will be sent to all registered attendees later today, and will also be available at a later date on the IBA Industrial YouTube page. We have dedicated a few minutes at the end of today's presentation for Q&A, so please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar at any time during the presentation, and we'll take as many as we can get to. I certainly encourage you to be as specific as possible when sending through your questions, please feel free to include a case, I'm sorry, please feel free to include an example or reference back to a particular area within the presentation to better assist our presenters in thoroughly answering your questions. But again, feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A function at any time during the presentation and we'll get to as many as we can. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters and I'll begin with Frederick Desi. Uh, Frederick is a medical physicist and has been working for more than 13 years in the radiation therapy department, delivering radiation treatment to cancer, cancer patients. Uh, he joined IBA 14 years ago, working for the particle therapy business unit in charge of proton beam dosimetry, integration of third-party systems in patient imaging. Uh, since March of 2020, he's been working for IBA Industrial's business unit as a product manager in charge of the X-ray solution. Uh, next, we will have Frederick Stickelbalt. Uh, Frederick is an R&D uh, new Nuclear Interactions Domain Expert and IBA Fellow at IBA. Uh, he pursued a PhD in high energy physics at Free University of Brussels, Belgium, and served in a fellowship role at the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, he also pursued a postdoctoral research role at uh, Fermi National Lab or Fermilab uh, in Chicago, and he has been with IBA since 2000 in a physicist capacity. Uh, right now, I will hand it over to Frederick Desai, who will begin speaking first. Hello, so I'm Frederick Desai. I'm manager for IBA Industrial, focusing on the X-ray uh, system that we can provide to you. And today, we're going to speak about what X-ray brings to you and we can have there also some opportunity to compare those x-ray with different other modalities so i'm really happy to talk to you with during this current webinar and so what you will learn during this webinar will mainly be the basic principle of the x-ray system how those one are produced and how you can use those system mainly what will be the important parameter to be able to use uh, those x-rays in industrial condition and finally what are the performance you could expect out of those systems and so for that we will have the opportunity to have Frederic Stickelboat with us and I will come back to that in a few slides so some remember uh, there was some webinar organized uh, since September 23rd uh, by IBA and the first one was mainly held by Byron Lambert and during his webinar Byron just go through the different uh, modalities that can be used to treat different products. There are different opportunities and uh, functionalities that can be uh, handle by those systems so you can have gamma irradiation we can have e-beam irradiation and x-rays those different ones have different uh, dose rate and irradiation time for different products 
we can see that for gamma, we have some uh, drawbacks from IBM as well in terms of product handling, either the time, either the size of the product. And today, we will really focus on the X-ray one and see what those one can really bring to you. And so we, we wonder what if we could treat a, a full palette instead of a single box? What if in your daily life, you can get rid of the palletization, depalletization? What if the, pro the product you will treat will really fit the beam delivery and will not be limited in terms of product size? So that's mainly the different aspect we would like to go through with you today in the current webinar. And so one of the, the reasons for that is that we would like to, to look at this curve. I mainly take this curve out of Frédéric Stickelboe presentation, and I will ask you to, to have a look at those different curves. We have here a depth dose of electron beams. And then on the green side, you have a depth dose of the cobalt beam, and on the blue and the red, you have depth dose of X-rays of different energies. What we can see is that electron is really fitting to treat product that can have a water equivalent thickness of five centimeter. Here we can see that the depth is mainly depth in water. So this means that you can treat easily product that go up to five centimeter in water equivalent thickness, or if you flip them, you can go up to nine centimeters to still have a good DUR. Frederic will go through those, those in details in the presentation that will arrive in a few seconds. And if we look a bit more on the X-rays, we can see that the beam is much more penetrating than the electron beam, and so and even more than the cobalt beam. And so here, this means that we can sing to treat a full palette of products on the X-ray systems. And to go a bit more deep in that aspect, we will have Frederic, so Frederic Stickelboat, that will present you really in detail those different aspects and Frederic is a high energy physicist uh, so he is also working in IBA as R&D nuclear interaction domain expert and what is really important is that Frederic has a lot of experience in X-ray so he worked in X-ray area since more than 20 years and he is also an IBA fellow and what is really important for IBA is that we try and we put our expert at your service. So now, Frédéric, the floor is yours. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Frédéric, for this uh, nice introduction. And so today I would like to speak about the properties of X-ray and my talk will cover mostly three topics. The first one will be about the generation of X-ray, how to generate X-ray, what are their properties, and I will say also a few words about the design of an X-ray converter because it's a rather important matter. The second part will be about the dose distribution of X-ray in product. There are different uh, methods to treat uh, palettes or product under X-ray. And so I will show you how these different methods on the product conveying, on the beam scanning, will affect the dose distribution obtained inside the product. And finally, my third uh, part will be about performance figure. So I will talk about dose uniformity ratio and throughput for three selected systems to show how the, the choices will affect the performance figure. So let's start with uh, part one, which is generation of high energy X-ray. So when electrons uh, hit matters, in fact, they will lose energy through two uh, processes. The first one is just collision, uh, which is the usual one, and it will produce heat inside the product. The, the second, or inside the target. The second one is about radiation, and so electron will produce X-rays, uh, uh, which are emitted from the target. Now, the, this graph shows that clearly the radiation yield, which is the fraction of energy transmitted in, in the form of X-ray, is strongly dependent of the electron energy, 
which is on the x-axis, but also on the target uh, Z, on the target atomic number. And so you want to use a high Z target, such as gold, tungsten, or uh, tantalum, in order to optimize the production of X-rays. Unfortunately, in, in industrial irradiation processes, we are limited to five or seven MeV for electron energy. And so as this energy, the yield of X-ray uh, emission is still rather low. And so for example, at five MeV, we obtain a conversion efficiency, which is of the order of 8%. Uh, 8% and at 7 MeV, it's a little bit larger, it's about 14%. But that means that all the rest is transformed into heat inside the target. Now, X-ray are produced by Bremsstrahlung, eh, which is breaking radiation when we interact with the electromagnetic field in target nuclei. And this Bremsstrahlung uh, irradiation leads to the production of a continuous energy spectrum between a minimal energy of about 100, 150 kF up to the maximal electron energy, five or seven, uh, seven MeV. And this is shown in the graph here. And so this is completely different from the cobalt 60 uh, system where you have monoenergetic uh, photons of 1.17 and 1.33 MeV. Also, the X-ray are emitted with a strongly anisotropic uh, spectrum. That means that a large number of X-ray are produced at, uh, at zero angle with respect to the beam direction. So in, in the same direction as the electron. And when you increase this polar angle, the yield is decreasing uh, rapidly. And so this is different again from cobalt 60, where you have an isotropic emission of uh, photons. No, this is the graph that uh, uh, Frederic showed uh, a few minutes ago. And so as X-rays are photons, they are neutron particles. That means that they have no limited range in matter contrary to electrons. And also their energy deposition is completely different and follows an exponential decrease with depth. And this is clearly shown in this graph where we compare the dose versus depth profile obtained with electron, cobalt-60, and X-rays. And so with electrons, as most of you know, the range will be limited to five centimeter in water, and so you have nothing above five centimeter. With cobalt and X-ray, you have an exponential decrease of the dose, and so you can reach very large depth value and still deposit some dose. And there is uh, still a difference between cobalt 60, which is shown in green, and X-ray uh, emission, which is uh, the blue and red curves, simply because of the different energy spectrum. Uh, cobalt has a uh, limited energy up to 1.3 MeV, while X-ray goes to five or seven MeV, and that's why they have more energy deposition at larger depth value. Now, as the X-ray conversion efficiency is rather limited for uh, five or seven, seven MeV electron, the use of industrial uh, X-ray will face several challenges. The first one is that you need high power electron generator in order to produce meaningful X-ray fields. And that's the reason why IBA developed this uh, TT1000 uh, rhodotron, which is able to deliver seven MeV uh, electron beam with a beam power of 560 kilowatt. Now, a lot of this energy will be absorbed by the target, the X-ray converter. And so you need to develop a very well cooled X-ray converter in order to process efficient, efficiently uh, pallets. And finally, you do not produce a lot of X-ray, so you want to optimize the capture of these X-ray fluxes as much as possible. And that's why we spend uh, a lot of time to develop different system using pallets in order to optimize the uh, X-ray processes. Now, let, 
let me tell you a few words about the design of an X-ray converter because you must also fulfill several requirements to have a nice uh, target uh, X-ray target. The first one, of course, is that you need an optimal X-ray conversion, and that's obtained thanks to a high Z layer such as tantalum. And there is a, a rule of thumb saying that the thickness must correspond to 40% of the electron range. Then you need, of course, to, to evacuate the heat which is deposited in the converter layer. And so usually we, we, you have a cooling channel with circulating water in order to evacuate all the heat deposited in the converter. Third, as the electron is not stopped into the converter, you need a third layer, which is uh, usually steel, in order to absorb the remaining primary, primary electrons and to prevent these electrons to reach the surface of the product. And finally, as you produce photons, which has a high energy, you need to select a converter material in order to prevent activation due due to photonuclear interactions. And tantalum is a very good candidate as it has a threshold for the gamma N reaction of 7.6 MeV, so well above the limit of uh, 7 MeV. No, and that leads to the uh, converter design developed by IBA, where you see here the, the X-ray converter, which is made of three layers. You first have a layers of tantalum, with a thickness of 1.2 millimeter for seven MeV electrons. You then have a cooling channel, which is three millimeter of water. And finally, a steel layer, again, three millimeter, that will stop the primary electrons. Now, as the energy deposition in the target is rather important, you always need to scan the beam along the target with a minimum length in order to spread the heat and limit the target heating. Okay. Now we come to the second part of the presentation, which is about X-ray dose distribution inside the product. So <clears throat> in an irradiation process, it's very important to understand the deposition of dose inside the product in order to define what is the minimal dose, the maximal dose, as these two quantities will be used to define the DUR, the dose uniformity ratio, and the throughput uh, in uh, the cubic meter per hour. And in X-ray, in fact, the dose distribution that you obtain in your product depend upon many factors. That will be the conveying method using either a uniform translation or a rotating irradiation. And there will be also the beam scanning along the X-ray target. And I will explain that there are different methods to do this beam scanning using either a product overscanning or a product overlapping. And also there is possibility to play with a beam scanning using either uniform scanning, non-uniform scanning, or even divergent or convergent beams. All the results we present uh, afterwards are based on Monte Carlo simulation mainly. And uh, we, we use uh, Jean 3 from CERN and MCN Peaks from Los Alamos National Laboratory to really understand the interaction of X-ray with, with the product and to understand how the dose are distributed inside the product. In this simulation, you try to be as uh, accurate as possible with respect to reality. So you want to include the X-ray target, the conveyor, the product, and also uh, the wood pallet that could absorb partly the, the X-ray. Once you have simulated these process, processes, you want to optimize the process versus the, either the dose uniformity, the do, uh, DUR, or either the throughput, uh, the minimal dose. Of course, we are not limited ourselves to Monte Carlo simulation, and we did also a lot of uh, experimental validation, either at Bridgeport in the US and BGS in Germany, using uh, CTA and alanine dosimeter and comparing uh, real measurements with Monte Carlo simulations. And just this is an example of a Jean 3 simulation for the two level pallet system. And you see the different elements, the scanning on 
the X-ray converter, the pallet, uh, the support. And then we, we shoot uh, electrons, which are shown in red. And then they, they interact with a target and they produce X-ray, which are shown in blue. And you see that while electrons are going all in the same direction, once they are converted into X-ray, X-ray goes in all directions and uh, they scatter inside the product and they deposit those everywhere. So it's really difficult to understand it without doing a, a full Monte Carlo simulation. Just a, a couple of examples of, of validation of Monte Carlo simulations. So we did, for example, a study of dose distribution inside the horizontal plane of a pallet using a CTA, for example. And so uh, we, I show here doses normalized to minimal dose to check dose uniformity. And on the left, you see the data measurements. And so we get a DUR of 1.33. And if the central and the right plots are obtained using Monte Carlo simulations, either Geant 3 or MCN peaks. And you see that the DUR we finally get uh, 1.35 for Geant 5, Geant 3, and 1.36 for MCN peaks, very close to the data measurements. And also the shape of the distribution is very good agreement between the Monte Carlo and the real data. Another example here is measurements along the vertical axis. So we radiate a pallet from the side. The pallet is 1.5 meter high. And we measure the dose in three planes, the bottom, the middle, and the top planes. And the two graphs compare real measurements obtained with alanine, which are shown with the red points, to MCNPX and GN3 predictions, which are shown by the blue and purple curves. And you see, again, a very good agreement, both in shape and in absolute value between the measurements and the Monte Carlo simulations. So now let's come to uh, predictions. What will be the dose evolution inside the pallet irradiated either in one-sided or two-sided irradiation? So I take a pallet, I irradiate it by the side and I measure the dose distribution inside the horizontal plane, uh, which is shown here by the uh, red, uh, red lines. So if you take a, a single side irradiation, you get this exponential attenuation of the dose. So the exit dose, which is shown here, is much lower than the entrance dose, which is shown here. And so if you compute the DUR, you get a value of 3.5, which is not very good. And simply by doing a double site irradiation, uh, you see here that you get a much better DUR, which is now 1.3. And you will always get the minimal dose at the center of the pallet and the maximal dose on the surface of the pallet. Of course, this dose uniformity ratio will depend upon the density of the product. And so I show already, already already show you the, the results obtained for a density of 0 0.1 with a DUR of 1.3. If you go to medium density of 0 0.3, you already get a DUR of 1.9. And if you get to go to high density, 0 0.8, then the DUR becomes very bad, five. And simply because of the physics of X-ray attenuation with depth. Hopefully, there are ways to improve the dose uniformity, at least for high density product. And this is, for example, results obtained using a rotating system. So instead of moving the pallet along uh, the conveyor in front of the target, you just rotate the product in front of a target. And so the reason for this improvement of the, of the DUR is that the center of the product is always staying in front of the beam. And so it's always receiving those, while a point at the surface of the pallet will only spend a limited amount of time in front of a target, and the rest of time it will be away from the target. And so instead of using, a, of obtaining a DUR of five, you see that you can improve it down to 2.1 using this uh, rotating approach. 
block enough for the, uh, those distribution along the beam axis. Now let's talk about the beam scaling. So the problem here is that you start from a beam which is just a few millimeter uh, shape at the exit of, of a machine and you want to irradiate a pallet, which is, for example, 1.8 meter high. And so you need uh, to use a scanning arm in order to scan the beam along the X-ray target. And the simplest approach is to have a single level of pallet and to irradiate with a scanning width, which I call W, which is a little bit larger than the palletate in order to irradiate the full pallet along the vertical axis. So that is called this overscanning technique. If you do that, again, Monte Carlo results, you see the evolution. So I divide my palette into layers uh, along the vertical axis. And in each uh, layer, I look at the D max and D min. And I plot D max and D min evolution along the vertical axis Z. And so you see that in the center of the palette, I have a D max of 5.2 kilogram, a D min of 4.2. So I find back a very good dose uniformity and the UR of 1.25. Unfortunately, you see that the the evolution along the vertical axis is not uniform. There is a, a shape uh, on, of this evolution. And so the D max and D min value on the bottom and top extremities of a palette will be lower than what you get in the center of a palette. And so when you compute the global DUR, you take the maximal D max, which is 5.2, divided by the minimal D min, the smallest D min, which is 3.1, and you get a DUR of 1.65. So that's already a 30% increase of a DUR compared to what you get uh, locally. Okay. The reason for this uh, variation of uh, D min and D max along the vertical axis is due to the angular variation of X ray emission. So if I take a point at the center of a pallet, it will receive a contribution from all the target itself. Uh, all the X-rays will uh, contribute to the dose, but when you go away from the center, you receive less and less contribution because you see that when you increase the angle, you have, you have less and less X-ray which are produced. Why, if you go on the edge, on the extremity, yeah, let's stay at the top of the extremity of the palette, here you just receive X-ray from this part of the target. And you see that here, the contribution will be extremely small. And that's the reason why, even if the dose distribution of the electron density along the, the target converter is uniform, the dose, obtained inside the pallet is not uniform. And so in order to obtain a good dose uniformity along the vertical axis, you have to use a scanning width which is much bigger, much larger than the pallet eight. And this is shown in the plot. I consider a pallet with a height of 1.8 meter. And you see that the ratio between D max and D min is, is decreasing if I increase the scanning width. But if I want to, to reach a non-uniformity less than 10%, I need a scanning width of 2.6 meter, 2.6 meter, yes, to treat a pallet of 1.8 meter, 1 meter. So there will be a limitation on the pallet height pallet that you can, you can treat. There is then another option, a second approach, which is called product overlapping where in fact you will use two level of pallets, level one, uh, lower level, upper level, but the scanning width on the X-ray converter will be smaller than the total height of the product. Typically the beam scanning width will be about 50% of the total product height. This is called product overlapping. And to obtain a good dose uniformity inside the pallet, you will swap the upper and lower level of the pallet. So that implies a four pass system 
uh, for, for the pilots. And this is shown here. So in the first pass, you have two pilots, uh, one on top of each other, but you will only irradiate half of the pallet, uh, this part and this part, the other parts receive very, uh, very small doses. Then you do, of course, the uh, 180 degree rotation in order to irradiate the other side of the pallet. And then you will swap the upper and lower level in order now to irradiate this part, which has not been irradiated in the first two passes. And finally, you do again a 180 degree rotation to finish the process. And so, how do we, what do we get? We get that in the first two passes, you irradiate mostly the lower part of this palette. And so you see that the distribution is concentrated in the first, in the bottom part of the palette. But then you, ex you swap upper and, up upper and lower level of the palette. And so this palette will be at the lower level and we receive this blue distribution of the dose. And so if you select the right W uh, uh, for, the, for the process, you see that the sum of the two distribution gets very uniform at the end. And so by swapping upper and low upper, lower and upper level, you can get a dose distribution which is very uniform, except maybe here because of uh, the presence of a conveyor and the presence of a, a wood support, which will slightly interfere with the uh, X-ray field. Uh, at IBA, how our system are uh, using a pseudo parallel magnet. So the beam is hitting uh, the target at 90 degrees, but there is also the possibility to use divergent, slightly divergent beam or slightly convergent beam. And so uh, we, we make measurements at uh, Daniken, the center in, in, in Switzerland, showing that playing with the convergent angles it's also possible to slightly improve the dose uniformity. Uh, the blue points are obtained using purely parallel beams and the other points are obtained by changing the angle. You can improve the DUR from 1.35 down to uh, slightly less than 1.2. So to finish this uh, second part of my talk, I just want to, to show you uh, some comparison of uh, measurements with simulations for the two level system installed uh, in Daniken in Switzerland. On the left graph, this is the DUR evolution as a function of density for, this is for a standard uh, palette, uh, uh, industrial palettes. And the blue curves is measurements done on the system. The red points are uh, Monte Carlo predictions. And the green points are uh, DUR obtained with a gamma system. And you see so that uh, you can get a extremely good dose uniformity for uh, full pallet loads for densities up to uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Uh, for uh, a density up to 0 0.15 gram per cubic centimeter, the DUR is better than 1.2 and it's even slightly better than the Monte Carlo predictions. Also in terms of throughput, this is the throughput in cubic meter per hour as a function of the density. And again, with the, the system, the measured system, you have a red curve. The blue points are what was obtained with, uh, was, was predicted with the Monte Carlo. And you see, so you have a, a very nice agreement or even a slightly better results for, uh, uh, for the throughput. Uh, you have something like up to uh, 16 cubic meter per hour for a density of 0 0.15 gram per cubic centimeter. And then finally, we come to the performance figure. So as I explained before, 
There are many ways to irradiate pallets using X-ray with one level versus two level system with double side or rotating irradiation modes. And all these choices will result in different performance figure, both for the dose uniformity and the product throughput. So here I will try to compare different systems uh, using always the same assumption. So I start with a beam parameter of 7 MeV 80 milliamp, uh, so corresponding to a beam power of 560 kilowatt, a scanning width of 2.1 meter, standard palette, uh, 1.1 1 .1 by 1.2 by 1.8 cubic meter, with densities ranging from 0 0 0.1 to 0 0.8 gram per uh, cubic cubic centimeter. And to estimate the throughput, I fix a minimal dose of 25 kilogram inside the product. So I selected three systems. The first one is a one level rotating system. So you have a, a <clears throat> only one level of palette and the palette is rotating in front of the X-ray target. Then you can have also the one level double side system. Uh, you irradiate uh, on both sides of a pallet, but always on a one level system. And finally, you have this two level double sided system where you make four passes uh, for each pallet in order to obtain a good dose uniformity. And so let's start by, for example, comparing the performance for a one level versus two level system. So uh, always 7 MeV, double site irradiation. And you see this evolution of the dose uniformity as a function of density. And so clearly the one level is shown with blue points, the two levels is shown with the red points. And in terms of DUR, you see that there is a clear advantage of using uh, two level compared to one level. Now, in, also in terms of, of throughput, uh, cubic meter per hour, you see that you have a gain of 25, 30% in the two level system compared to the one level system. So there is a clear advantage, both in those uniformity and in throughput for the two level system compared to one level system. <clears throat> now let's compare a double site with a rotating system. And here, you see that the dose uniformity evolution as a function of density is completely different between the two systems. With a double site, you have a good dose uniformity for low density, but as soon as you reach higher density, you see that the DUR start to increase very uh, badly. While with a rotating system, you are able to keep a good dose uniformity for medium density up to very large density, uh, 0 0.8, you see that the, the DUR is still better than three, while it's at 6.5 for a double side. In terms of uh, throughput, of course, for low densities, the rotating system re reach leads to worse results. But you see that starting at 0 0.4, you get similar throughput uh, for both systems simply because you, you have a better dose uniformity and so you don't lose so much X-ray just eating the product. And so you get similar uh, throughput for high density product. And so if I summarize all these result in the same, uh, same plot, you see that for medical devices uh, where you have densities, uh, up to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.25. Clearly the, the dose uniformity are good for all the systems with a, an advantage for the two level, two side system. In terms of throughput, you see that the two level, two side system is also the best one compared to, to the two others. If you go to food product with density ranging from 0 0.35, up to 0 0.8, you see that the only way to get good dose uniformity is by using a rotating system in green. And in terms of throughput, of course, the two level system remains uh, higher than the others. And the rotating system leads to similar results compared to the one level system. So I try to summarize this 
into uh, just a simple uh, table. So if we consider a medical device with low density, and you want to uh, rank throughput between low, medium, high, and those uniformity between good, medium, and poor. And, and you see that there is a clear winner here, which is the two level, because it gives you a good dose uniformity and high throughput. So that's the one you want to, to select. Now, if we go to food product with densities uh, above or equal to 0 0.4 gram per cubic centimeter, you see that uh, <clears throat> rotating system is probably the, the best one because it gives you a, a, a good dose uniformity, which is important for food product, with a medium uh, throughput, uh, which are about similar to one level system, maybe slightly lower than the two level system, but with a, a, a good dose uniformity. So let's summarize with four key uh, messages. So X-ray are produced by Bremsstrahlung with when seven or five or seven MeV electrons impinge on an high Z material such as tantalum. Being neutral particles, X-ray deeply penetrate inside matter and thus it allows the irradiation of full pallet slows with a good dose uniformity. The dose distribution inside the product is strongly affected by the irradiation condition. And so you have different choices between double side or rotating irradiation, beam over scanning or product overlapping. And so really depending upon your application, some system offer better results than others. And if you go for, if you only treat medical devices, you would probably go for a four pass system giving you best DUR and best throughput. While if you want to treat a food product, then you would go for a rotating system with very good dose uniformity and uh, medium uh, throughput uh, figure. So thank you. Thank you, Frédéric, for this very clear explanation on how X-ray are produced and can be used. So I'm pretty sure that uh, you, uh, listener, will have a lot of questions on the practical aspect and how we can put those uh, knowledge and those way to treat product in practice. And so for that, we mainly uh, foreseen some uh, upcoming webinar. As you can see, we got already some webinar related to the e-beam. We uh, started today with the webinar related to X-rays and two more will arrive. And so the next one will happen on April 29th. And this one will really be dedicated to the different solutions. How can we take the principle that Frédéric explained us today and how we can put a real conveyor to handle the different product. How can we work on the optimization of those different conveying system? And how can we track those different products in the, the process mainly? So the, all those questions will be answered in the coming webinars. So please stay tuned and be ready to, to get additional information on those uh, coming webinars. And right now, we will be ready to answer your different questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to our excellent speakers. Again, the Fredericks, as I like to refer to them, uh, Frederick Stickelbalt, as well as Frederick Desai. Uh, we have dedicated time right now for Q&A, and I know we've been receiving questions thus far, but I want to encourage our attendees to continue to submit your questions while I welcome our uh, wonderful presenters onto the screen. Please turn on your cameras, gentlemen. While they're coming on the line to all of our attendees, I'm just going to launch a very quick poll. We do want to get your feedback on today's presentation. I'm going to leave this open for just a brief moment. So again, please jump on the screen and fill in your feedback for today's presentation while our panelists are coming on the line to take your questions. 
Again, this poll is launched, so please drop your questions in. Uh, as Frederick announced in his closing remarks, registration will be open soon for our next webinar chapter, so please be on the lookout for those uh, details to be coming at you soon, April 29th. Uh, closing this off in just another few seconds or so, and we'll be jumping into the Q&A. Thank you so much, everybody, to participate. Uh, we'll close this off in just the next few seconds, so please do drop in your answers. And again, uh, updated details on our next chapter in our series with IBA Industrial will be coming soon. And I'm going to close off the poll. Thank you again to everyone for entering in all of your answers. We certainly do appreciate that. Um, gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Let's jump right into the Q&A. Thank you again for your uh, questions that you uh, have submitted for all of our uh, attendees. Let me just pull this up very quickly. Uh, OK, so. Um, Frederick, first question is for you. You mentioned that the target is in uh, tenetolum, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, water to cool down in steel. Why is it not the target completely made of tenetolum in place in steel? Could we use other materials like tungsten? Yes, maybe I can answer that. Uh, so <clears throat> the fact is that uh, when you leave uh, the, the 1.2 millimeter of tantalum, your electron energy is reduced to 3, 3.5 MeV. And so the, the probability to produce X-ray with these low energy electrons is extremely small. So it's not useful to have tantalum. Moreover, tantalum is a rather expensive material. So you want to use a, a cheap material as a stainless steel because it does not contribute anymore to the X-ray uh, generation. Now about tungsten, as you have seen in the presentation, the, the target is curved uh, to, the tantalum target is curved to, uh, support the pressure of the water. Huh? You, you need to evacuate a lot of heat, so your water pressure is, is high. And tantalum needs to be water form in order to uh, uh, contain the, this pressure. Tungsten is a very uh, hard material, and you cannot uh, water form a tungsten like tantalum. And that's the reason we selected tantalum because it's true that on the physics point of view, tung tung tungsten would probably be slightly better than tantalum, but from a machining point of view, it's not possible to use uh, tungsten now. Mr. Stiekelwald, thank you so much for that answer. We think your video might be frozen, but we're still hearing you clearly, so no problem there. <laughs> yes. We all know technology happens. Thank you so much. Uh, next question, I'm just gonna keep rolling through these, and this is for uh, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, what about optimization of target to pallet distance? Is there an optimal distance to balance uniformity and throughput? That's an excellent question. So um, practically the distance, if we stay reasonable um, between 10 and 50 centimeters doesn't have a very big impact on the, on the DOR itself. But obviously the, the X-ray will scatter and so in the air. So we try to keep that distance between the target, the tantalum target and um, the product as low as possible. And as I said, we achieve uh, probably 10 to 15 centimeters. And that's what we, uh, we do practically because we also want to avoid damaging the target um, with the, the palace if for a product moves, for example. So that would be my, my answer for this question. Thank you so much. Uh, another question for Frederick Sickelwalt. Is the tantalum target isotropic? What type of X-ray field would you get if you were to adjust the anastropy of the target for a, oh my gosh, you guys got a lot of difficult words in here for me today, <laughs> for the pref preferential x-ray emission field. I'm so sorry, I, I apologize. So again, is the tantalum target isotropic? What type of x-ray field would you get if you were to adjust the anastropy of the target for a preferential x-ray emission field? Pardon my mispronunciation there. Well, uh, I don't know what panelists mean by uh, uh, anisotropy of a target. Huh? The, the target is, is more or less, uh, uh, it can be seen as a flat target where electrons are hitting the target. No, 
changing the direction of the X-ray is extremely difficult because X-ray are neutral particles and they are emitted in all directions. So uh, playing with, a, for example, with the thicknesses uh, of, the, of the target would be extremely difficult and would have a, a limited impact on the, on the final results. So we, we try to keep it as simple as possible using a, a, a uniform uh, target thickness all, uh, all over the, the scanning arm. That would be my, my answer. If I can add, Fred, uh, well, something interesting is to, is to vary the speed of the beam. That's maybe more yes. effective. Um, yeah. But so that's changing the, yes, changing the uh, electron density along the target is something we, we consider because that would improve the dose uniformity that you obtain with a uh, overscanning system. Uh, you could try to deposit more electrons on the extremities of the target compared to the center in order to balance the dose distribution, the non-uniform dose distribution obtained uh, inside the product. From a theoretical point of view, it's possible. Uh, we've done a, a, some simulation uh, with such kind of non-uniform beam scanning, but we need still no, to validate this from a, a practical point of view. Thank you so much to both of you gentlemen. Uh, jumping around just a bit, and a thank you again to all of our attendees for these excellent questions. Uh, for Frederick Desailly, are rotating systems in commercial use today, or is this a theoretical option? So as far as I know today, there are no real uh, rotating system installed and in use in daily practice. Uh, what we have done is that we, we work with some uh, provider to, to have a, a solutions that will make sense. And so we, uh, that's something we, we have in our catalog, but that is not yet uh, really installed in the reality. So that's mainly a theoretical approach that show us that there will be a gain for the mainly the, the product that will have higher density and mainly there we will focus on a uh, food area and that will ma make some sense for this, uh, those kind of products. What is interesting, Fred, is that we, we turn product all the time and every day on our site. Here, the difficulty is to, to do it in front of the beam. And so we have the radiation and also to control the speed of the, speed of the rotation. So technically uh, it's doable. But as we will see next month, there is a, there is a, a trade-off to do between the fact of stopping the pallets, starting the acceleration and turning it, uh, instead of going, for example, for sides uh, or double sides. So it's a tra trade-off between DOR, throughput, and this is, uh, this is uh, actually the, the challenge of the rotation. Lovely, thank you. And looking forward to next month. Uh, another question for Jeremy. How do you ensure quality control when swapping of upper and lower pallets when using one X-ray scan horn with two level pallet processing? Is this performed manually or is this automated with material handing systems? Excellent question. So we will see next month that there are actually different ways to do uh, this double level, uh, this uh, uh, technique for, uh, for X-ray. Uh, the first one is to have two conveyors in parallel, roller conveyors. So right there you can control the speed and the product position very precisely. And then you swap, you swap it in the back or you turn it in the beginning in front. The second way to do it is to have a big tote with the two products. And so we actually have the, the same tote moving at the same speed. And so you, you can control the speed of the product. Then you swap it and you have the same effect. So to, to make the, the, the quality control, what we do is that we, we put CTAs and or, or dosimeters on the flange itself, on the tantalum to, to make sure that the scanning width is con constant and that we have the dose rate that we want to have. Uh, during the qualification of the center, we also put these uh, dosimeters at different distances uh, from the um, from the target, and to do that, we have to remove a section of the of the conveyor. Um, in the quality control, then we just simply uh, on the product itself, so we can move the product uh, up and down. And 
nothing is done manually and technically because the conveyor manages uh, everything, the flipping, uh, the, the up and down, and all the process is managed by the process control system. And so you have typically 10 passes in front of the beam. And so this is all automatic, but you need to do uh, the, 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 the system qualification, so that we call uh, IQ, OQ, PQ, that we have to do uh, regularly to make sure that the system is delivering what it has to, uh, to deliver. I hope that was clear. No, oh, thank you so much. Our next question is for uh, Frederick Stickelbalt. Uh, any advantage of beam over scanning over product overlapping approaches? Well, the, the major advantage is that uh, it's a simple, uh, much simpler system. Uh, when you will see this two level system, as explained by Jeremy, you have a very complex conveyor system with at least two levels. You need a, a lift system to, to swap upper and lower level. So it's rather complex. And so the investment is, is uh, rather large. While with a one level system, it's much more easier to, to handle. Uh, you just have a one level of conveyor. You, you do the rotation uh, behind a, a wall and then and that's it. So from a practical point of view, a one level system is probably much easier to implement than a two level system. I don't know if Jeremy want to, to comment. Yeah, I think you meant that it's a little less simple <laughs> <laughs> not super complex. <laughs> no, but that's true that it's actually two, two uh, conveyors of, of the same time. So it's, it's less simple to go uh, double level, but it has, so, it has so many advantages in terms of DOR um, and uh, flexibility of the system. Uh, but that's true that uh, a simple translation, that's, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's cheaper. It's simpler, but it has some limitation. And that limitation, as Fred said, is that you have to put 10, 20% of the beam above and below the product. But in the end, you have to look at the profitability of your center. And so again, a trade-off between uh, maybe more, a bit more complex conveyor or um, a, a very simple one. Thank you both gentlemen for the perspective. Truly appreciate it. We've got time for two more quick questions here. Uh, Jeremy, how would you describe the present adoption of the X-ray sterilization modality for commercial medical device sterilization? And a two-part question here, where could I get a medical device product commercially sterilized using X-ray as of today? Uh, that's an excellent question. You know, at IBA, we, we have been uh, promoting with some partners X-ray for, for 20 years, and we have seen a lot of curiosity. So we have sold a lot of those, uh, you know, duo system where you, you do mostly e-beam, and then you have some time in X-ray for uh, to discover, to validate product, uh, and to, to, to transfer some of the product or to, to welcome new products to qualify them uh, for X-ray. Recently, it has totally changed. So we see a really faster adoption of X-ray all around the world, and in all the continents, also for the food irradiation. Uh, so it's really uh, picking up very fast now compared to what we have known uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And also we see that the, the technology of uh, everything, the conveyor, the accelerator, the, the, the targets, everything is now a lot more mature than what it was uh, 20 years ago. So adoption is increasing uh, very fast and uh, we'll see in the, the next five years, I think a lot of those uh, X-ray projects. And as we have more X-ray, we have more qualification, we have more experts, we have a, a bigger community. So I'm very enthusiastic on what uh, will happen um, in, the, in the coming five, five years, maybe, maybe three actually. Uh, to answer the second part of the question, uh, I think there are a lot of good service providers. Uh, you can simply Google it, I don't want to, uh, to cite names here, uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's really accessible right now to, uh, to pass products in X-ray. And, and if you want to, do, to go deeper into it, if you want to try it, if you want to do some experiments, some dose mapping, there are also excellent uh, centers for qualification and research. Uh, we have a partner that everybody knows, which is called Aerial in France, where we can actually uh, we can run pallets or simple boxes. So there are many ways to uh, to get in touch with X-ray, to uh, to try it, to see uh, how it works, uh, to have hands-on trainings. So um, that will also accelerate, I think, adoption in the in the coming years. Thank you so much. And uh, two quick questions that we're going to get here to uh, Frederick Desai. Vertical beam or horizontal beam? In your opinion, uh, which is better? 
So that's also a, a very good question that we we, we have also uh, studied, and uh, it mainly depend on uh, the different aspects and the, the density that you will, your product will have, and also the throughput that you will expect out of your system and the footprint as well. So uh, it's mainly depending on those different aspects. When we look at the dose distribution inside the product. When we do a comparison between the uh, double level, so the two pallets, one on top of each other, or the um, uh, horizontal uh, beam, where the product will mainly go from up to down in front of the beam, we reach mainly the same uh, DUR. We, we arrive to a, a DUR that is quite similar between both uh, systems, uh, but then the other question need to be uh, explored and need to be uh, addressed mainly. Thank you so much. Um, and last question here for uh, Fred Stickelwalt. Slides 36, 38, and 39 uh, stated that the level one, I'm sorry, the one level rotating system showed DUR as being higher at lower densities, decreasing in the range of 0.3 to 0.5 uh, GCC, and then increasing again for densities greater than 0.5 uh, GCC. Can you explain why this happens? Yes, this is a good observation. In fact, it depends on the attenuation curve of uh, X-ray in the product, and that depends on the density. And for low density product, in fact, the attenuation is rather uh, small. And so with a rotating system, the center of the pallet is always in the center, or is always irradiated, and it turns out that it becomes the maximal dose. You, you see really a, a, a peak appearing in the center of the pallet compared to the surface. And when you reach 0 0.3, then you, this peak decrease and you get almost the same dose on the center and on the surface of the product. And for higher density, that's why you have this very good DUR. And for higher density, then the, the process is reversed and you have the, the center dose, which is smaller than the dose at the surface. And so the DUR, again, start to, to increase. So this is just related to the attenuation curve uh, evolution as a function of the product density. Okay, thank you so much. And one last question here for Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, what is the capital and running costs of an X-ray solution in comparison to gamma? So that's always a tough question that in, a, in a, a few days, you can get a complete uh, business plan generated by our experts. So I can certainly send an email, you send the list of products and you will get that comparison very easily. We, have a, we are used to that for a long time. So you get an Excel file with the, the, different, the differences. I would say it depends on many, many factors, but typically probably 20, plus 20%. For, uh, for similar uh, center, uh, certainly the, the, the horn may be a bit more expensive, the conveyor also, but even if you've seen that there are some, some very simple conveyors. So don't hesitate to, uh, to send your products. You fill an Excel table with the products, we run it to the model and we compare it. Uh, we give you the electricity consumption uh, for the, the OPEX and the, 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 the capital investment also. And so it's better to, to look into it in detail because I've seen system which are maybe smaller and when, same price for the same volume and the same the same uh, uh, treatment uh, quality. Uh, sometimes it can be a double if it's, the product is not adapted and you need to move it all around to uh, to palletize it, depalletize it. So it's not an ans a, a simple answer. And I'm sorry about that. The equipment is al almost the same. Huh? It's still roller. It's still a rodotron, which is modular. Uh, so you need a bit more electricity. That's for sure. Uh, but in the end, you, you save DOR. So you save you win in, on the throughput side. So it's not a straight question, but it's easy to get an answer. So don't hesitate to, uh, to, to call us and you, you'll get a, a good and clear answer to your question. Lovely. Thank you so much. And I know we're at time and want to thank all of our attendees for investing your time with us today. Again, we hope you found the course helpful. I will be in touch with a copy of the presentation recording, which will also be made available on the IBA Industrial YouTube page, as well as all of the previous chapters in our series. Um, but thank you again to our speakers for their time today. Uh, Mr. Frederick Desai, who's the product manager at IBA Industrial, as well as Mr. Frederick Stickelbalt, who's the R&D nuclear 
Interactions Domain Expert and IBA Fellow at IBA. Uh, Jeremy Risson, always appreciate you being on for Q&A as well and providing your perspectives. Uh, we will be in touch soon and registration will open for our next chapter. Uh, so please be on the lookout for that. And of course, any questions for uh, the IBA team or myself, please don't hesitate to reach out to webinars at q1productions.com. Uh, everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. Be safe and be well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rook. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rook.